is going on, guys? Thank you so very much for joining me right here on episode 308. This is part number one for your January 10th, 2020. This is Off The Script, the number one pro wrestling podcast in the YouTube wrestling community. And man, as always, every single week, I got the news. Like the Street Profits got the smoke, I got the news. And what we got is a major prediction from yours truly in regards to the Royal Rumble. Now, you guys know how much I want Matt Riddle, my bro, to win the Royal Rumble. How I want Matt Riddle versus Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 36. And how I want WWE to create a new star. Will they do it? Probably not. I'm going to blow your minds on a prediction that I'm going to give you today on the podcast that nobody in the community is talking about, but it could very well happen at the Royal Rumble. With Lesnar entering at number one, that number 30 position is going to be more important than any other year we've seen it, and that number 30 position could be Brock Lesnar's WrestleMania opponent. We got Vince McMahon still wanting to bring in Tyson Fury for WrestleMania. I hope they bring him to any other promotion but WWE. He doesn't belong in the company. I don't want to see him in the company. And I hope he gets knocked out by Deontay Wilder on February 22nd. Because if that's the case, Vince ain't going to bring him in. So Vince wants to bring him in. I don't know why, but it's in the news and we'll go over it and I'll give you my opinion on that. The real reason why Brock Lesnar is an entrant in the Royal Rumble will go over that and what Russell Votes has revealed to everybody this week following Monday Night Raw. NXT, Monday Night Raw, SmackDown News, affiliated with all three brands, plus the week's ratings. All this, plus so much more right here on Off the Script. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. If you enjoy whatever you see here in this video, remember to hit that thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on the bell for all notifications. Make sure you guys follow me on social media, at JD from NY206. That is on both Twitter and Instagram. Thank you guys so very much for all the recent love on Twitter and Instagram. We are nearing 30,000 followers on Twitter. I'm waiting for my blue check mark, man. We should be verified by now, but the Bluebird has a problem with good old JD, just like everybody in WWE. You know, there was something on social media. Speaking of social media, I seen. If I remember to put it up in the podcast here so you guys can see it, I want you to go and blast his page because we have the power to do so. Corey Graves, I know, probably fucking hates my guts. If he knows who I am or listened to anything that I said about him, he probably fucking wants to uh, lynch me along with half the fucking roster. But Corey Graves tweeted out, and I had an old college buddy of mine tweet out that Corey Graves is looking for YouTubers or content creators or anybody to talk the shit with on After the Bell. So a lot of people, I woke up to it, mentioned my name and my good college buddy, Bethany, who just recently had her second child. So congratulations to her. She's awesome. I don't know if she's listening or not, but, you know, I wish you all the best and thank you for all the support. She tweeted me about this Corey Graves tweet. She mentioned me and a lot of people, you know, caught on to it and I retweeted it and I tweeted to Corey Graves. I'm like, Graves, really? You want a YouTube wrestling figure in the community to be on after the bell and you're not, you're not looking at me? I I knew I was going to tweet this guy and was going to be the most liked tweet in the fucking thing outside of Busted Open Radio. It was. I told him, bro, I'm 20 minutes from Stanford, Connecticut. I'm 20 minutes from Titan Tower. Why wouldn't you think about bringing me in? I I know you don't want to get schooled. I know you don't want to look like a complete buffoon. I'll really make you look like a clown with the shit I got coming up, you know, with uh, all my logic and my questions about what happens on WWE. I know it's not going to happen. These people probably got my fucking picture. Plastered in the locker room. Public enemy number one. Do not let this man within fucking a thousand miles of of, uh, any arena that we're in. You know? Rollins probably wants to pour hot coffee all over me. But I'll put the tweet if I remember. If you guys go to his Twitter account, you'll see it there. I don't know if he's got it pinned or not, but tweet Graves. Get JD. Get off the script. Tweet me, at me, you know? 
whatever. Like the tweet. Put me in the fucking thread. Blast him. Because there's nobody in the community that's going to blast him like I would. Legitimately. I just fucking, oh man, I just go in on him. I really would. You know, and, and, and to be honest with you, I love to talk shit about WWE or I like to banter back and forth about WWE and raise some really big concerns with anybody. I'll be respectful, I promise. I promise. Not if Rollins is there. Or Alexa Bliss, I don't know. Anyway, go and do that on Twitter. Thank you guys so very much. Um, at JD from NY206. Patreon, if you guys want to do the Patreon, I think patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Shout out to all my patrons down below who have Signed up for the month. You guys get a shout out down below. So thank you all so very much for that. And the podcast today is brought to you by my good friends over at Tavor. This is craft beer delivered. Tavor takes it to the next level, man. It makes it as easy as possible to access and discover the highest rated craft beers from all over the world through their mobile app experience. It's free, by the way, on Google and iPhone. They're featured in CNBC, Men's Journal, USA Today, Fortune, and Bloomberg. And how it works is the following. You're going to download the app. Download the app, get access to -to hard-to-find, 100% independent craft beer from all across the United States. New beers are shared every single day. Discover your beer. Build your own custom box of the beers you love or enroll in a subscription. And they'll automatically snag the highest rate of beers that suit your taste profile. No minimums or commitments. And they'll ship any amount of beer handpicked by yourself to your doorstep for a flat fee. Or if you guys want to sign up for a subscription service through Tavor, the shipping will be free. It's 100% independent community. 650 breweries featured. Beers from 47 states. And there's over 7,000 beers tasted. Guys, Tavor does beer rights, and you guys can use code SCRIPT. If you guys want to purchase anything through Tavor, use code SCRIPT at checkout, and you guys are going to save $10 off any order of $25 or more. I thank them for supporting the podcast and getting JD as much cold beer and cold beverages and access to over 7,000 cold beverages, man. I love it. Tavor, link is down below in the description. Use that code script, that checkout. And I want to thank them for supporting Off The Scripts. All right, man. Let's start at the top. The ratings. Everybody loves the ratings. I don't give a shit about the ratings, but I report on the ratings because everybody else gives a shit about the ratings. The ratings are news, so it's part of the news, so it's got to be in the podcast for all those people who don't give a shit. I got to talk about it because we all love to see the WWE fluctuate up and down. I like to see when they're down mostly because that's the only way that they will learn. But this is WrestleMania season. We're going into the Royal Rumble. We're going into WrestleMania. The ratings should be up. The ratings should be higher than normal. So hopefully we get good quality television to accompany that moving forward. Now, SmackDown largely sucks. But the ratings have kind of evened out. There's one thing that I do notice about the SmackDown ratings. They don't go up. They stay at that 2.3, 2.4 average that the show is doing. And they should be doing more, no question. With all the promotion that Fox gave them. With all the hype that they got behind the big Fox machine. Nothing. I really don't believe it. Now, they're drawing higher ratings than they did when they were on the USA Network, but this is not impressive to me whatsoever. You figured they'd be trending in the threes, at most the threes, and we're not even getting 2.5. Why is that? Why is that? That is people is people's interest in pro wrestling that's withered? Does nobody give a shit? Or is the WWE product that god awful? That they have their people, they have their set number of people that are going to watch, and that's pretty much it. They're not generating any any interest. They're, they're not getting new eyes, they're not getting new ears. Yet the WWE seems to think that they're doing an admirable job with the ratings. I don't see it that way. I don't see it that way. I see it as if the WWE put on better shows, then the ratings would show that. And they have not put on good shows. Now, I don't know... Who 
for whatever ungodly reason, would watch this show, being that Baron Corbin has been in the main event or hovering around the main event for several months now, why you would watch this show? Just look at the main event scene. Why would you watch this show if you did not have to watch this show? I have to watch this show because I have a job to do. If I didn't have a job to do, I pray upon everything that I have, I would not watch this show. I would not watch this show at all. It's a waste of my time. There's nothing about this show that generates any interest to me. I'm not interested in anything really. Their storytelling and their writing is fucking pedestrian. I could do a better job on how to handle the fucking talent on this show. But instead of me complaining, let me go over the ratings here. They've averaged out. They're not doing anything anything more than what they're getting. Averaged out at 2.417 million viewers. That's down 1% from last week. Show opened up with a 2.467 million viewers in hour one and dropped 4% to 2.369 million in the second hour. That 18 to 34 demo, the show was up 25%, finishing at a 0.5 rating. That matched the best rating in that category that SmackDown has had since November 8th, 2019. Yippee. Let me break out the fucking champagne. In the 18 to 49 demo, SmackDown was up 7%, averaging a 0.7 rating. Baron Corbin's good for the youngins, I guess, said nobody. Uh, by the way, they're already advertising a main event of Baron Corbin and Dolph Ziggler versus the Usos for main event. Great job there, man. The Usos are back for one week and they're already in a fucking program with Baron Corbin. I, I guarantee you, they wish they were back where they were. I hope not. Because where they were is, uh, is no good. You don't want to be where they were. Anyway, other than repeated programs that aired on ABC, SmackDown trailed all other programming on the major networks in terms of total viewers, which is nothing new, really. In the 18th to 34 demo, they matched Hawaii 5 I don't even know what Hawaii 5 is. I'd love to go to Hawaii. I'd like to send Baron Corbin packing to Hawaii so I don't have to see him anymore. But I don't know what it is. Magnum P.I. And SmackDown finished in the middle of the pack in 18 to 49, trailing... Those two shows and 2020. I have 2020 vision. And you know what my vision says? SmackDown sucks. So the average, if you look at the average from November 1st, 2019, all the way up until this most recent show, they're averaging 2.45 million viewers. That's what they're doing. It's not really anything groundbreaking. They should be hovering above the threes, but they're complacent and they're lazy and they would rather just be ordinary then push the limits. They got their set number of people that are going to watch, and they are happy with that. They don't give a shit. They don't give a shit about being better, and I can't stand that. I really can't. And it's amazing being on Fox that they have not generated more viewers. It's not like it's a USA Network where they were drawing 1.8, 1.9. This is now the A show every week. This is every week. They're drawing the same ratings, and they're not pushing themselves to be better. Maybe it'll get better because this stretch between January and April is their money-making season. Most of the eyes that are on WWE watch for this particular time of the year. Then they don't watch all year round. That sucks. You got to get all those people who watch between January and April to stay watching between April and December. Moving on here. Speaking of SmackDown, Matt Hardy quietly moved to SmackDown and was moved profile-wise From Raw to SmackDown. Why is that? I don't understand that move. In fact, I do understand that move. I don't understand why WWE quietly moved him with no explanation, but I understand why they did it. According to the roster page on WWE.com, Matt Hardy has been quietly moved from the Monday Night Raw side to the SmackDown side. There was no explanation given then he was listed as a SmackDown superstar on WWE.com. Typical WWE uh, move here. They do things without explaining to anybody because they think their fan base is a bunch of fucking idiots. That's what they think. Hardy recently returned to action a few weeks ago and he was put into a gauntlet match against Ricochet for the United States title, which is on Raw. He was also buried by Buddy Murphy on Raw. 
And then Rebby Hardy went to tweet on social media, uh, you didn't need my husband all year, and now I'm about to give birth, and now you need him for a three-minute match against Buddy Murphy? Really? Don't get on Rebby Hardy's bad side, folks. It is not a place you would like to be. Hardy recently returned to action on Raw. He's been used to put over younger talents. His WWE contract is set to expire on March 1st. Yo, Cody! What's going on, bro? I'm now free. Let's be broken, bro. What's going to happen? There's a good chance that he will be leaving the company. Good chance? Uh, If I'm Matt Hardy, there is no way I'm looking back at the WWE. I'm looking forward to being elite. Whether that means just doing his own thing in the broken universe or being unveiled as the exalted one with the dark order, Matt Hardy needs to go. No matter where he goes, Anywhere but WWE. Hardy has not shut the door on signing another contract, but his main issue is that he wants to be used better since he realizes that his next wrestling contract is likely to be his last wrestling contract. PW Insider reported that Jeff Hardy's contract will not expire at the same time as Matt since time was added on top of Jeff's deal because his contract was frozen, being that he needed to address legal issues and he was injured as well. So both of those things combined have been added on top of Jeff's Hardy, uh, Jeff Hardy's contract, and he is looking at another possible full year in the WWE when he should have already been up as far as his contract is concerned. Why did WWE quietly move Jeff Hardy to SmackDown? Folks, it's not that difficult to figure out. It's quite simple, to be honest with you. You see, WWE is trying to make a play to get Matt Hardy on SmackDown because, in their minds, Jeff is probably cleared and ready to go. All WWE needs is for Jeff to take care of his legal issues, go take care of that shit, make sure all of that's squared away, come on back to work, and look at what we have for you! Look, your brother Matt is here! We moved him to SmackDown on Fox! From Monday Night Raw with no explanation because our fan base is fucking stupid. You see what we did there? We gave you the Hardy Brothers. The Hardy Boys are back in action on Friday nights. That's all. That's the only reason why they did it. That's all they had to do. Look at what Matt is asking for. He he wants he wants some creativity. He wants some direction as far as how they're going to use him. Clearly, they're not using him in a singles role on Monday Night Raw because if they wanted to use him, they would have used him. He's been ready to go. And he looks fantastic for the shape that he's in and being someone that is as old as he is. He isn't really old, but, you know, in in the pro wrestling world, he's up there. You know, he's got a couple more years left. He wants to give the best he can. He wants to give all of himself to the remaining years of his contract to entertain us. WWE, if they found value in him, they would have used him. So... The one thing that he's complaining about is not money. It's creative. It's creative. So, in WWE's mind, all right, we'll move him to SmackDown. That's where Jeff is going to be. Jeff is ready to come back. We'll put the Hardy Boys together. Look, Matt, we got something creatively for you. Can you stay now? It's the only reason why they did it. And that is fucking pathetic. And I hope Matt sees right through it. I hope he goes to AEW. I hope he does what he's got to do. And then when Jeff sees Matt over in AEW, when his time is up, the Hardys will be in AEW. Or wherever they end up. Wherever Matt is going to be, Jeff is going to be right there. Because they come as a package deal. So that's the reason why Matt Hardy was quietly moved to SmackDown. Is it pathetic? Yes. Is WWE foolish? Yes. Does WWE think they're slick? Yes. Does JDC right through their bullshit? Absolutely. fucking lootly Ridiculous. What a fucking lame, pathetic... Desperate maneuver to get Jeff Hardy and Matt Hardy together and most importantly, keep Matt Hardy in the WWE. Please sign a new contract, Mr. Hardy. No. I hope to God he doesn't. Speaking of contracts, WWE is very confident that the revival... (laughs) Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, let me call let me call Dash and Dawson up. Bro, listen to this. The WWE is very confident that they are going to get you guys to resign with the company. What do you say about that? 
Oh, you want the Lucha Brothers. Oh, oh, you want the Young Bucks in a major tag team showdown for the AEW tag team. I know. I know. Well, listen, you better break the news nice and gently to the old man. I don't think he's going to like this. In fact, in fact, you might be buried on the way out. So anticipate some pies and some hemorrhoids or whatever Vince McMahon has as far as toilet humor goes. It's going to be uh, flushed your way. All right, I'll talk to you guys later. Maybe I'll call one of your matches. Maybe in Hog. Stop by Hog for a little bit, man. We got some decent fucking shit going on over there. You know, Master P's in charge. I'll talk to him and I'll get you guys maybe in at one of the events coming up this summer. All right, cool. I'll see you guys later. There you go. Cole Dash and Dawson. WWE is very confident the Revival will sign new contracts. Uh, Listen. Listen. You know... A lot of people think that this is a joke. Seriously. It's all about the money. It's all about the money, right? To some people, it is. Look at that roster. Look at that roster. You got lifers there. Zack Ryder, Kurt Hawkins, Jinder Mahal. Where's Jinder Mahal at? He signed a five-year contract. Mojo Rawley signs a new five-year contract. What is the most that they've done with Mojo Rawley? peaked in Eric Rowan's cage and then he got scared. That was the extent of his fucking uh, athletic and uh, acting ability on Monday Night Raw. Five years for that. Five years for that. Some people just want to take the money and run because they know that they will not amount to anything. They're lazy. They're complacent. And EC3 can probably, probably be lumped into that. I don't see EC3. If WWE offered him shut up money just to stay and not go anywhere, even though WWE hasn't fucking lifted a goddamn finger. They haven't moved one single muscle to use this guy. They haven't used one brain cell to collectively come up with a thought about how to use him. What do you think he's going to do? Shut up, money. Multi-millions just to sit around in catering and look pretty wearing a fucking $5,000 Louis Vuitton suit. You think he's going to say no? Of course not. Of course not. You ain't going anywhere. You're going to sign this contract and you're going to shut the fuck up. That's exactly what they're going to tell him. But the revival... I don't see that in the Revival. The Revival have made their mark. The Revival have made their name for whatever ceiling WWE put over them. They they did the best that they could. You know, I will always remember them as the tag team that just opened my eyes and made me fall in love with tag team wrestling again down in NXT with the likes of Enzo and Cass when they were hitting their stride and American Alpha and my goodness, man, DIY. Those matches with DIY, the two out of three falls match at NXT TakeOver Toronto for the Tag Team Championships, man. A fucking masterpiece. A masterpiece. These guys, they don't give a fuck about the money. Money is important to everybody. Not saying money should not be an important factor of where you go, where you call home, where you work, how you make your living. Not saying money is not important. But there are other things in this world, like happiness... That money cannot buy. These guys are clearly not happy. They're not. And I don't look at the Revival as two guys who would take a multi-million dollar five-year slave contract with the handcuffs of Vince McMahon tied to it to just stay with the WWE. I don't see that in them. I look at these guys and I see two guys that care about tag team wrestling, two guys that care about the sport so much that they would walk away from all the money that Vince is able to throw at them for a little bit less that Tony Khan is going to offer them. To go to AEW and not only make the money, might not be as much, but make a mark on this business that Vince would never allow them to do and make. That's what they want. And that's why if they leave the WWE, I would have all the respect in the world for them. And I'm not saying that they're going to move the needle. Nobody's going to move the needle. Nobody is going to move the needle. CM Punk is not even going to move the needle. Might be for the first couple of weeks to a month, two months, three months. And then it dies off like everything else in this fucking business. People get bored. Not saying the Revival are going to move the needle. I'm not going to say the Revival are going to, you know, take the business to new heights. Brody Lee is not going to do it. Marty Skrull's not going to do it. Tessa Blanchard's not going to do it. Nobody's going to do it. Killer Cross is not going to do it. But when they go, and I hope that they do, 
Everybody's going to know where they go and who they are and the work that they do. Everybody's going to know about the revival. They've already made their mark in the WWE to a point where they're going to go and they're going to change the outlook of pro wrestling. They're going to have a bigger name wherever they end up than they ever had in the WWE. Now, there are going to be some detractors with that statement. Well, they would have never gotten their opportunity. They would never be where they are without the WWE, which is true. But that doesn't mean they have to stay and never achieve the heights that they know that they could achieve. So thank you, Vince McMahon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to wrestle for your promotion. You don't respect us. You don't really appreciate what we bring to the table. And we have all the talent and the desire and the fucking heart to want to just give to you. And you don't want it. So we're going to go and give that to somebody else. It's very simple. It's very simple. WWE is very confident that the Revival are going to sign new contracts. Man, I don't know what they got planned, but if it's not a complete overhaul of the tag team division, like what I've been pitching, a restructuring of the tag team division from the ground up, and I mean merging the fucking divisions. I'm tired of repeating myself. How many times do I have to sit here every single week, whether it's Raw or SmackDown or fucking NXT? How many times I gotta repeat myself? The Monday Night Raw tag team division consists of the Authors of Pain, who have not wrestled a tag team match two-on-two since they've been back. And you got the Viking Raiders, the Street Profits, and the fucking OC. That's it. Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins don't count because they're not a legit tag team. WWE hasn't treated them like that, and I'm not going to say they're a legit tag team based off that aspect. Nobody. Absolutely nobody. Monday Night Raw has no division. SmackDown's no better. Heavy Machinery... They really haven't done much of anything. They got Otis feuding with uh, fucking God knows who because he's infatuated with Mandy Rose. They got Bobby Roode and Dolph Ziggler. Who gives a shit? The New Day, the Usos. Who else they got over there? That's it. I know I'm probably missing one, but that's all they have. I don't understand why you have all this tag team talent and you're not utilizing them. Don't you think that merging the divisions would probably be be best for everybody? Honestly, you could probably even do the same thing for the women. Not only does it give you more depth on Monday Night Raw and more depth on SmackDown, it gives you the option of not being so repetitive. It gives you the option of having fresh matches every week, exciting matches, matches that get fans excited. What I would do for the tag team division, you want a fucking, you, you want a vote of confidence here, WWE? Why don't you take the best four teams from Raw, the best four teams from SmackDown, you you make a Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic-like Tag Team Tournament, and you take the two teams in these these brackets, and you merge the titles at WrestleMania. That's what I would do. Strip everybody of the Tag Team Championships. You're going to come out, and you're going to hit the reset button. No more Tag Team Championships. One Tag Team Championship to represent both Raw and SmackDown. Don't know why you can't go and do that. That would be the best thing. That would be something the Revival could look at and be like, wow, that's gutsy. That's different. That takes balls. I didn't expect that. Maybe we'll listen to you now. Instead, you've done nothing to offer them change. And by the way you're booking them, they want to be booked better. I don't know what else to tell you. According to Fightful, Scott Dawson's deal will expire in May. Dash Wilder, who has had time added to his contract due to injury, will be a free agent in June at some point. The belief at the start of the year was that WWE wasn't letting the pair go because of their fear. They would simply jump straight across to AEW. Apparently, that is no longer the case. Wilder posted the following on Twitter at the turn of the new year. 2017 was a wash. 2018, we got our groove back. 2019, we took back control. 2020, we changed everything. I don't know if that's just him being overly optimistic, but change cannot happen without the approval of Vince McMahon. And without the approval of Vince McMahon, you will change nothing. Simple. The only thing that will change is Vince McMahon's underwear. If that. Does the man sleep? He probably sits in the same fucking suit for four days because he's a goddamn fucking zombie. I don't know. Change means going to AEW. 
change means vying for that brand's tag team championship. I'm over the revival in WWE. Get the fuck out of there and move on with your careers and be placed in a promotion and be around people that legitimately want to give you the best and utilize you to the best of your ability. I can't stand this revival resigning, very confident. WWE's got some fucking balls to throw that out there to the dirt cheese. Yeah, we're very confident that the revival are not going to AEW. Really? Show me how fucking confident you are. Speaking of the revival, at the TLC kickoff show, there was a back and forth between the revival and Booker T. Now, the revival piqued a lot of fans' attention when they showed, showed up to the TLC kickoff show and got in Booker T's face. The top guys challenged the team of Harlem Heat, Stevie Ray and Booker T, if they were down. Now, Booker T, Booker T seems to be ready for this match in Houston, and it would certainly be a big draw for the local market if they want to sell more tickets. Booker T might be ready to give up, you know, putting any type of work that would go into this match because WWE hasn't shown anybody that this match is becoming a reality. During his WWE, uh, I guess not his WWE podcast, it might as well be a WWE podcast because I'm sure they monitor all this shit, but it's not on their podcasting network. But Booker T has a podcast, if you guys don't know, called Hall of Fame with Booker T. And Booker T gave WWE one week from, I believe, this past weekend to book the match with the Revival and Harlem Heat at the Royal Rumble. He doesn't want to have this match booked with one week's notice. He says, and I quote, I have not gotten any invitation yet, and the thing is, if they don't tell me in the next week, I am not doing it. They're on the clock. So I'm putting this out there right now. If they don't let me know within the next seven days, don't call me, because I'm not going to... I'm not going to start training for that match with one week. I'll stop putting in all the real hard work. Don't call me at the last minute. I'm not going to be ready. Don't call me at the last minute because I need time to, you know, dot, dot, dot. My mind's got to be right going into this thing. I got to be focused. I don't want to put in all that work for nothing. End quote. What are you talking about, Booker T? You should know better than every anybody that WWE, you know, one week is their M.O., it's what they do. Oh, we want to book this match? Yeah, we'll give it one more week to uh, just let it marinate out there and let the fans think about it. And then we'll get the ball rolling and have one week of show to do and then build it and then we'll just go into the pay-per-view. So it seems logical that WWE would book this match being that all of this happened at the TLC kickoff show. The Revival and Booker T put in all the hard work actually building the feud. All WWE needs to do is announce that the match is happening. But as of this week, still nothing has been planned or talked about or we've seen nothing on TV. And I mentioned this already when I talked about it, when I brought up the revival on their contract status and where they're going. Why would WWE book this match? Listen, WWE could look at this in two different ways. One, they could use this match and book it at the Royal Rumble and bury the revival due to a Hall of Fame team just being booked better than them. WWE could use this match with Harlem Heat to bury the Revival 1-2-3. Revival thinks they're so great. Look at how this Hall of Fame tag team treated them at the Royal Rumble. They could do that. WWE could also look at it as why are we going to book this match and reward the Revival for basically doing nothing. They don't want to listen to us. They don't want to show their loyalty and their dedication to the company. They haven't signed new deals. Why are we going to give them a match with... Somebody that we respect in Booker T. Why are we going to give them a match with a Hall of Fame tag team that's in our Hall of Fame just so that they could build their resume as they're set to leave anyway? WWE could look at it in two different ways. So they could book the match and get what they want, and they could not book the match because the Revival really haven't shown any loyalty and dedication to being with the WWE or wanting to be with the WWE. Two sides of the coin. So... However, however you guys look at it, as of right now, I couldn't give a single shit about the match happening. I don't want to see it. And I'm with Booker T. Match like that deserves some time on TV. Match like that deserves some TV time and some proper build. You're not just going to throw the Revival versus Harlem Heat, especially with Stevie Ray. He's never had a match in WWE. Booker T hasn't had a match since God knows when, right? You need that match to kind of just 
take shape on TV and get people excited about it. You can't do that in one week. So I'm with Booker T. If you don't do it now, which is already too late, don't even bother doing it. And if I'm him, hopefully he really does not pick up the telephone when WWE calls. I don't think they will, though. I think that match is not really on WWE's radar. It was never on WWE's radar. One would think that it was, being that they had the Revival go out there on the pre-show to confront Booker T. But maybe WWE changed their mind, and in typical fashion, they didn't let Booker T know what their plans were. Who knows? Monday Night Raw, shifting gears over to Monday Night Raw, the Raw rating. This is a big deal. Everybody was like, ha, 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 ha. JD ranted on the wedding. Ha, 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 ha. JD ranted on the wedding, and it drew the highest rating in Monday Night Raw for the past three months. Now I'm saying, ha, 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 ha. See what I did there? This week's Raw averaged 2.39 million viewers, which is down 2% from last week's wedding episode. But I'm here to ask a very simple question. Let me reiterate that first line to you in the report. 2.39 million viewers. Down 2% from last week. But I thought the Lana and Lashley wedding was to bring in new fans, right? I thought all the millions and millions and millions of views on YouTube that everybody bragged about was going to make Monday Night Raw trend in the threes. And everybody was going to go out of their way to watch Monday Night Raw based on the 5 million views that the fucking angle did on YouTube. Cretans. Every single one of the people in the community who blasted people like me for hating on this storyline. You don't know anything. This is what the people want. They have to appeal to the audience. This is entertainment. Right? I heard it all. They gotta appeal to a wider audience than just the simple niche audience that NXT is. You can't get full wrestling on Monday Night Raw. But why are you out there touting the four and a half, five million views that the wedding clips did, the Liv Morgan debut clip did on YouTube, if it's not translating into viewership for the main show. It's exactly what I said it was. People refuse to watch this fucking steaming pile of garbage and they are much rather in the boat, they much rather be in the boat of digesting this content In small doses. Remember, I had to sit through 30 minutes of this fucking garbage. It's very easy to sit through a three-minute clip on YouTube and accumulate 5 million views based off the most shocking angle that took place on Monday Night Raw. The YouTube views mean absolutely nothing. Because if that's the case, Monday Night Raw should have did a 4 and a 5 million viewership rating on Monday Night, which they didn't even do half of. So what is it? What is it? Was the angle a success? No, it wasn't. It was not a success. It was desperate. It was shocking. It was shockingly bad. It wasn't shocking in a good way. It was shockingly bad. It was an embarrassment of epic proportions. And it showed, like I mentioned last week, that Vince McMahon is absolutely incapable of writing a good pro wrestling storyline that gravitates To the audience, people want fucking tabloid garbage. And this is what Vince McMahon has done to train his audience. This is what he does. The viewership on YouTube means nothing. Now, next week's Raw, which is going up against college football and the championship game of Clemson versus LSU, will be the last show against any major sports competition until the NCAA finals in April. Basketball finals which usually starts Raw's biggest ratings period of the year. Next week's show is being intentionally loaded up to try and keep the ratings momentum of the past two weeks rather than give up against the game and shoot for a big number in two weeks. This week's episode was down 3% in the 18-49 to demo from last week, which would be considered strong given the number last Monday was the best for the show since an appearance by Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair, which is also sad. 
This goes to show you that nobody wants to watch the current crop of stars, that they go out of their way and fucking uh, stroke their cocks to Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair. Unreal. Unlike last week, which held up better for all three shows, this had the usual pattern of a big third hour drop. The show opened up with a 2.72 million viewership. Closed with a 2.19 million viewership in hour three. The audience was up from 2.33 million viewers for the same show one year ago. The hourly breakdown is as follows. 2.56, 2.41, and 2.20. So that's that. Next week's Raw, like I said, will run in direct competition with the Clemson LSU National Championship game. Those games generally pull in a ton of viewers. And the show will be back down into the 1.9 range, no question. Dave Meltzer commented on Wrestling Observer Radio that WWE knows what kind of competition they have on Monday, so they're loading up the show for that very reason. It will be interesting to see what else WWE books for next week's Raw. Either way, it's going to take a major hit in viewership due to college football's biggest game of the year. So that is that. And again, I win against everybody who wanted to blast podcasts like mine that hated the wedding. Where are all those YouTube views? Nowhere. Exactly where they need to be. Not being translated to the fucking show on Monday. Because if they were so great, and if the angle was so great, people would have trended this show massively upwards coming out of last week. And apparently in that third hour, nobody gave a single shit. Fans actually trolled WWE for proclaiming Raw and USA Network dominated the ratings in 2019. Now, I don't know what ratings they dominated. They dominated the bottom of the fucking barrel in the ratings for 2019. I don't know what they think they dominated. I mean, Monday Night Raw broke their own record seven fucking times last year for the lowest rating for a non-holiday edition of Raw. What did they dominate? I'd love to know. WWE viewership is not what it used to be. Obviously. Not with this crop of fucking talent riding the show. The product is not experiencing the worst business in the company's history, but it's pretty damn close. Ratings-wise, it's the worst it's ever been. Money-wise, revenue-wise for the year, they're up. The ratings, on the other hand, are not necessarily calculated by how many people tune in, but which percentage of the demographic pays attention. Fans are smarter now more than they've ever been. The internet provides fans with immediate access to information and clips and YouTube videos and you can digest the show in fucking 30 minutes compared to sitting there for three hours like we all have to do or podcasts like mine that have to do. USA Network recently boasted that they were the number one cable channel in 2019. Then WWE followed with this message talking about how great of a tag team they are. The tag team of Raw and USA Network dominated the ratings in 2019. Fans saw this message from WWE and obviously social media, Twitter, wrestling Twitter, could not contain themselves. Fans dragged the company many different ways and I'm not going to go over what was said. I mean, we've said the same exact shit here on the podcast. I don't need to go over what some fucking parasite on social media said. WWE might pull in a steady rating, but the viewership numbers is what a lot of fans think about most when they hear ratings. WWE has topped themselves seven different times this year for the lowest non-holiday number that Raw has ever done. This year alone, or I should say 2019, WWE has driven Raw to the worst ratings the show has ever seen in 20 Seven years. What exactly did they dominate? Whoever's in charge of WWE social media account is a blithering fucking idiot. Now, I'm sure he got, you know, word from the top. Put this out, put this out. Whoever devised that tweet is up for termination because you're asking to be shit on. You don't think the fucking fans know the ratings? Give me a break. What a fucking embarrassment. The fuck does WWE have to do with USA being the number one cable network on television? They're definitely up there. But as far as rating standards and what we expect, 
the WWE to be drawing as far as a rating? It's nowhere, nowhere where it should be. Fucking ridiculous, man. This company doesn't know how to embarrass themselves, man. They, 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 it's like they want to embarrass themselves. Good. The more you embarrass yourself, the more I laugh. At your expense. I love it. Monday Night Raw. Seeing the U.S. title match end in confusion. There's a reason why this happened. Now, I thought the match was great. It's really hard not to say a match between Andrade and Rey Mysterio was not great. I mean, it's the same shit that we've seen. If you watch these guys battle back and forth earlier in the year when they were both on SmackDown, it was the same shit. They didn't really bring anything new to the table. It was a decent crowd that was hot for what was going on. And they worked very well together. I mean, they should. They're both similar styles. They both work very well together. WWE Raw had a United States title match. Plenty of fans were talking about the match, but more fans were talking about the strange ending when it was over. Rey Mysterio and Andrade appeared to have ended their match in confusion after Rey Mysterio accidentally took out Zelina Vega. It appeared that the referee stopped the match from finishing, and I, and I mean he stopped the match. Andrade had Ray in the hammerlock DDT, and the referee, John Cone, pulled Andrade out of the hold just to tell Ray to go out and attend to Zelina Vega. Now, I don't know if that spot was supposed to happen. I don't know if that was genuinely an accident, and they had to call an audible on the fly. I don't know if the match was supposed to be included with that spot, and maybe Ray or Andrade or both forgot their spot. I don't know. I don't really know. But Rey Mysterio had to go out and check on Zelina Vega for a moment. Then he re-entered the ring to take the pinfall and eat the hammerlock DDT anyway. Brian Alvarez, Brian Alvarez explained this situation during Wrestling Observer Live and gave his assessment on this apparent miscommunication in the ring. I think what happened was the whole part of the story was that Rey was supposed to knock out Zelina Vega and be very concerned about her well-being and then they would go to the finish. Maybe Andrade attacked him too early, so they called an audible and told Ray to go back out and be concerned about Zelina Vega because this whole thing didn't make sense at the end. It kind of took away from the match. It's exactly what I said on my Monday Night Raw podcast on Monday. Took away from the match. I don't give a shit about the match. It was the ending that was just incredibly bizarre. Like, John Cone legitimately took Andrade and pulled him out of the hammerlock DDT. It looked ridiculous. You heard John Cone talking to Rey Mysterio go out, and then he was doing one of these to Andrade, just wait, wait, wait until Rey. It was ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And then he took the mask off Rey Mysterio, did Andrade. Hit the hammerlock DDT, took the mask off Rey Mysterio, gave it to Zelina Vega as a way to say, I'm sorry, look at what I did. I beat him and I got you a souvenir in the form of his mask. And then Rey Mysterio, during a promo later on in the show, attacked Andrade when he was doing a promo with Zelina with Charlie Caruso, and he took the mask back anyway. Just very weird. Now, I pitched mask versus hair, or mask versus title, whatever you want to do. Whether it happens at the Royal Rumble, whether it happens at WrestleMania, I would prefer it to happen at WrestleMania. I think Ray deserves that type, type of send-off from WWE. I don't know if WWE is capable of booking this match to WrestleMania. I don't think they're capable of much nowadays, but I would like to see it happen at WrestleMania. And that would be Ray's last match in WWE. He loses to Andrade. He doesn't get the United States Championship back. That has eluded him for a couple of months now. And he takes the mask off, gives it to his son, and goodbye. Epic moment right there. WrestleMania moment right there. I don't know if WWE is going to do that. I don't know if they have the, the capability to do that. Like I said, we'll probably get this at the Royal Rumble and then all is gone. And then they'll both move on to whatever they got to do next. But that's the reason why the match ended in confusion. Looks like they called an audible according to Brian Alvarez. And it just came off very bizarre. And it was the one thing that people were talking about in what was otherwise a very good match. Same old shit. But otherwise, a very good match between two guys who always have a very good match. WWE on Raw. If you guys noticed, after the OC was in the ring and AJ Styles did what he had to do, 
He was mocking Randy Orton. WWE's got Randy Orton versus AJ Styles on Raw coming up this week. There was a incident in the ring. I didn't know what was happening. I was watching live, and then we came to find out what it really was after the fact. Now, AJ was in the ring. He beat Akira Tozawa. Whatever. After the match was over, AJ was walking up the ramp, and the officiant in the Lana and Lashley wedding rolled into the ring because that was the segment that was coming up next. I didn't know what was going on at the time. It looked like somebody in Oklahoma was wanting to fucking get his 15 seconds of fame. He was wearing a suit, which I thought was very bizarre. Like, who the fuck's in the crowd, in this crowd, wearing a suit, wanting to show up in the ring and jump the barricade and get in the ring? See, these two big security guards jump on top of him. They show a camera angle of it, and then they zoom away. Vic Joseph's in the middle of a sentence. He stops talking. They go right to commercial break. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Keep it classy, Oklahoma. Keep it classy. But this was actually a part of the storyline. With Lana and Lashley. I ask why. I don't get it. I thought it was a legit fucking jumping of the barricade on Monday Night Raw. Then we come to find out that it was the officiant. And the officials or the security guards didn't know that he was actually a part of the show. Then we learned that it was actually a part of the storyline. With Lana and Bobby Lashley. Those of you who watch Raw or read the reports will know that there was a major quote-unquote botch in the form of what I just talked about. But apparently, it was all a master plan, according to sources. The writers at WWE planned the whole thing, and as I'm reading this, I still don't know what the fucking point of this really is. Rick Malone is the actor who played the officiant. That's his name. Spoke about the incident after the show. Says, and I quote, In my defense, I was only trying to do my job and officiate the Bobby Lashley and Lana wedding on Raw, but security wouldn't let me into the ring, so I had no other choice but to dive in head first. Oh, that didn't end so well. Obviously not my best camera angle. End quote. I got no reason as to why this was done based off what he said. According to a source close to Ryan Satin, Cretan, geek, loser, WWE Backstage, uh, he is, uh, I guess, report. I didn't watch WWE Backstage. I guess he reported this on WWE Backstage. The whole thing was scripted because, well, I'll let you guys figure that one out. That's what he said. According to Loose Lips Backstage, you know, Loose Lips on Reddit, who gave you the inside scoop as to what was going on when Bobby Lashley and Lana were arrested. He played it out. Sequence for sequence, everything happened the way Loose Lips played it out on Reddit. Loose Lips said backstage, and he's got a good record of reporting backstage news, that this was the stage direction. And I quote, in arena, unidentified man, the wedding official, is attempting to get in the ring when he is confronted by security. That was legitimately what Loose Lips said was on the script. Why? Why? I tell you why, WWE is so desperate for attention that they knew everybody shit on this angle so they needed something else to get people talking. It's the only reason why they did it. And you know what? It worked. It worked. It got people talking. What we thought was a legit jumping of the barricade ended up being a botch and it went from being a botch to legitimately being a part of the fucking show. WWE is desperate. This is what they're for. Imagine, imagine if they focused one-tenth of this energy on something important on this show. Like they did this. All the resources and the energy and the effort to do this, which has absolutely no importance to anything. If they applied that to something that we legitimately care about, imagine how good it would look. Unreal. Absolutely unreal. These writers are fucking mental. Probably came from Vince, from Vince McMahon, but... It makes no sense. Absolutely makes no sense. WWE Backstage, they increased viewership this week. I guess everybody wanted to see Mike Mizanin. Show Buzz Daily reports that WWE Backstage had a rise. They rose above size in viewership. You know, Chad Gable, rise above size, bluechew.com. Use code JD 
at checkout, bluechew.com. A little cheap plug there. WWE backstage drew 124,000 viewers up from last week's audience of 97,000 viewers for their New Year's show. I mean, is, is, is it even comparable? I mean, who the fuck is watching on New Year's Eve? Please, you're out banging a chick somewhere before the ball drops. You're having a glass of champagne. You're watching WWE backstage. Really? I'd love to know who was watching WWE backstage. Please come forward on New Year's Eve. I'd love to see what you look like. Are you even old enough to drink? Jesus Christ, go find a fucking hobby and stop, please. WWE backstage seems to fluctuate in viewership. One week it's up, one week it's down. Punk is there, Punk is not there. People watch, people don't watch. Who gives a shit? I haven't watched since Punk was last on. I don't give a shit when he's not there. Why would you? Why would you? Perhaps the basketball game that led into the show and carried on past 11 p.m. could have helped WWE backstage retain some of that audience. Who cares? Who cares? And then we'll go over what uh, The Miz said in his little Instagram post that CM Punk couldn't help but put on blast on social media, which was eventually deleted. And everybody's like, oh, it's a work. Oh, Punk's in the rumble. Oh, ice cream bars. People don't know when to fucking quit. CM Punk makes his WWE return. The Miz, WrestleMania. Give me a break. Give me a break. Ember Moon. Ember Moon, someone who's on WWE backstage as a semi-regular guest. She's got nothing else to do while she's recuperating from an Achilles injury. Folks, if I told you, let me take a sip of water for this one. Might get heated. If I told you. If I told you that Ember Moon, an up-and-coming, promising young female talent in WWE who should have been pushed, who should have been pushed, and should have been given the platform to unleash your ability. Everybody might not be an Ember Moon Mark. I'm an Ember Moon Mark. If I told you that Ember Moon injured her Achilles in a wrestling match, would you believe me? More than likely. It's a very dangerous sport. They're risking their lives and their livelihood when they go out there each and every night. It's not really something to, uh, to really laugh at. It's a very dangerous profession. Now, if I told you that Ember Moon injured her Achilles chasing the 24-7 championship, would you believe me? Would you believe me? No? Because that's the case. Ember Moon injured her Achilles, not in a wrestling match, not in a competitive match vying for the SmackDown Women's Championship or on her way to capturing a Raw Women's number one contender. I don't even know what fucking brand she's on anymore. Do you? Does it even matter at this point? I don't believe that Ember Moon, instead of injuring herself in a legit wrestling match, injured herself running around the ring, chasing Carmella when she had the 24-7 championship. During Booker T's Hall of Fame podcast, Ember Moon revealed that her Achilles rupture did not happen in the ring. In fact, it happened during a 24-7 championship segment where she was asked to chase Carmella. She says, and I quote, I know this is going to hit the dirt sheets, so we're here in San Francisco for a Raw and SmackDown. She said she was called to be at Raw a day before so she could put over Lacey Evans. Oh, joy. Imagine getting that fucking phone call. Yeah, uh, hey, Athena. Yeah, we want you to put over Lacey Evans in about two minutes. Can you do it? What do you say? How would you feel if you're Ember Moon on the other end of that line, rolling your eyes? Oh, my God, man. I'd rather fucking sit at the bus stop and play Pokemon Go for three hours. Really? Put over Lacey Evans. Then she had to fly out for SmackDown when the show was still on Tuesday nights. This was back when the show was still on Tuesday. She continued, and I quote, I made it to the hotel, getting ready to go to SmackDown the next day, and we were like, and they were like, hey, Ember, you're in the 24-7 title run because Carmella won the night before. I was like, ah, ah. Yeah, sure. Are you sure you need me for that? 
is what she asked. Let me reiterate that. They called her to tell her that she was in a 24-7 title segment running, chasing Carmella, and she even asked, ah, y'all sure y'all need me for that, is what she said exactly, word for word, quote for quote. Y'all sure y'all need me for that. You know what's weird? It's like when you know you have a bad feeling about something. Oh, ah, really? Really, this woman, this poor woman, Athena, was having a bad feeling about the 24-7 title segment. So I had a feeling and I was like, oh, do we? Okay, cool. You know what? I'm a team player. Screw it. I got this. I'm in. So we do the run and I told our truth. I was like, truth, you better run. I'm going to catch you, truth. If I catch you, I'm tackling you. And you're going down. And so when we actually did it, I almost literally caught them right before we went through the curtain. So they go through the curtain and they didn't realize how close I was behind them. So we go through the curtain and I was coming through. The curtain shuts. I open it and go through. Truth is dropping Carmella. And I have to hit. I'm going full speed. And I had to hit the brakes. I was like, whoa, boom. And I felt a pop. It felt like a scratch. Literally, I was like, huh, that feels weird. I'm not even wasting my energy yelling about this. The 24-7 title needs to die in a fucking fire. And I mean a full-on fucking blaze that is never-ending. The 24-7 title needs to fucking absolutely die in a fucking fire. I don't know who, if you support that fucking title being on television after I just read you that story about Ember Moon injuring her fucking Achilles, can you imagine being a pro wrestler? Can you imagine being a professional wrestler in the WWE and you ruptured your Achilles and you're out for what could be a year, a year and a half, and you're out for that duration of time because, not because of a wrestling match, but because of a 24-7 fucking title chase in which R-Truth had to tackle Carmella in the back and you couldn't stop running and had to put on the brakes and it had nothing to do with a fucking wrestling match. If I'm Ember Moon and that title's still around and they ask me to do something like that, absolutely you could fucking suck my dick, kiss my ass, bend over and fucking shove it up your ass. That's what I'm telling them. That is absolutely, that's one of the most pathetic things I think I'll report all year. That is absolutely sickening. Absolutely sickening. I don't know who would want to come to this company just based off that. If that title is on fucking TV anymore this year, man, I swear to fucking Christ, that shit has got to go. That shit has got to fucking go. Give it away. Sell it on eBay. Get the fucking title out of the company. Get rid of it by any means necessary. It's got to go. Fucking ridiculous. AEW Dynamite. They destroyed NXT in the Wednesday night ratings, which I'm surprised by because after that, I swear to God, man, after that women's segment, after that women's title segment, I was shocked that people were still watching the fucking show. And I know that we had Moxley and Jericho coming up. I know that we have MJF coming up with Cody. I know there was another six-man tag with the Jurassic Express and the Best Friends. I get it. The overall show was not bad. It was not bad. But that women's title segment left a horrible fucking taste. And no matter what happened at the end of the show, even though the rest of the show was not bad, it was that last hour that was really good. It was that that fucking time, that 8.30 to fucking 9 o'clock spot that was just god-awful. I'm surprised people still watched because I don't know who enjoyed that shit. I know everybody that I know absolutely blasted not only the women's division and the status of the women's division, but that overall segment, period. And I don't think a lot of people are a fan of Brandy Rhodes at all in the current fucking role that she has right now. I got to say something here because um, it's something that I was looking over as far as the comments go on the AEW Dynamite podcast on Wednesday. I don't get people, man. You know, people, they don't think. They really don't think. They don't use their brains. They see something and they jump, right? They don't think before they jump. 
They don't think before they type. They don't use their fucking brain to construct a logical fucking thought. I was talking about the women's division. I was talking about the state of the women's division and what we got to do to fix it. I was talking about other logic gaps on AEW television, primarily with Pac and Michael Nakazawa and whatever else happens on AEW Dark or whatever the fuck's going on. Shit that I don't really give a shit about. I questioned something about Pac. And it's in my duty to mention this because it should be seen on the TV show. But a month ago, Pac was, I don't know where they were. We've seen Pac walking in the locker room. He walked into Michael Nakazawa's dressing room. Michael Nakazawa was just sitting there with his back to the door, you know, bouncing along to his headphones and his uh, MP3 player. You know, whether he's got an iPod or an iPad or a fucking phone or a Zoom or whatever the fuck he's got going on. He's just bouncing his head there, right? And there's no packs behind him. Pac closes the door. We don't see Pac and Michael Nakazawa anymore on the show. Kenny Omega's in the ring. He just got done with a match. He runs to the back and he tries to go and check on Michael Nakazawa. Before he gets to Michael Nakazawa, we got the Lucha Brothers stopping them in the back. They take down Kenny Omega because that's what they do. They're a bunch of dicks. Hangman Page chases the Lucha Brothers off and that was it. AEW didn't do anything on Dynamite didn't say a thing about this on Dynamite. Didn't show a vignette or a video package or a fucking YouTube clip. Nothing on Dynamite. So we watch on Wednesday. And we get the same storyline again. But this time, Pac laid out Michael Nakazawa. He put the Brutalizer, the Rings of Saturn, on Michael Nakazawa. Kenny Omega's in the ring. Him and Paige just be private party. He runs to the back to go save Michael Nakazawa. Page just standing there drinking beer. I don't know what the fuck he's doing. Maybe he's a a newly alcoholic. I don't know. But Omega runs to the back. Do we see Omega and Pac anymore for the rest of the evening? No. I complained about this. And people, you know what people told me on social media? You know what people told me on the comment section? On my AEW Dynamite review? Well, JD, you show how misinformed you are. You have to watch AEW Dark. You have to watch Being the Elite. This is the responses that I get to my concerns about logic. You gotta watch Being the Elite. You gotta watch AEW Dark. Meanwhile, remember when I said people don't think before they fucking type? They just go? Folks, if AEW is having storylines play out on TV... And the continuation of them are only seen on AEW Dark and on Being the Elites or whatever fucking YouTube show that they got. Don't you think the logical thing to do would be to take said YouTube clip and show the fucking clip on Dynamite? Because how many fucking people watch Dynamite and everything that's associated with AEW? I know I don't. I got my wrestling feel for the fucking week. I'm here watching wrestling every single fucking day. You think I want to be doing that? You think I love pro wrestling so much that I'm going to go out of my way to watch AEW Dark and Being the Elite and the road to this and the road to that and the road to your fucking mother's 68-year-old fucking vagina, right? I'm going to watch NWA Power. I got to watch TNA Impact. I got to watch MLW. Give me a fucking break. JD, can you cover eight hours of New Japan? What do you think, I'm a fucking android? Yes. Let me fucking roll off the same conveyor belt that Charlotte Flair is fucking duplicated on. Let me watch Wrestle Kingdom 14, Okada, Ibushi, Overload, Overload. Are you fucking out of your mind? Jay White. I don't give a fuck. I don't give a shit. I want logical fucking TV. You want me to care about a storyline. Yet, you want to blast me for not watching AEW Dark. Oh, I'm sorry. Who the fuck gives a shit about AEW Dark? 
who watches Being the Elite. I watch Being the Elite maybe once every couple of months. I don't give a fuck what happens on Being the Elite. I don't give a shit. Why are you having storylines play out on Being the Elite when you have fucking two hours of AEW Dynamite? A weekly TV show. And if you're doing a storyline that you're going to put on Being the Elite, then you should put just as much effort into showing the Being the Elite clip on Dynamite so that we're all fucking clued in. That's my rant. Dynamite. Surprised they won the viewership. 947,000 viewers. They got on Wednesday. Compared to NXT... NXT did 721,000 viewers. I thought NXT was a very good show. I really thought it was a very good show. They set up for TakeOver Portland. We got Gargano and Balor. That was confirmed, pretty much. Now, Balor has already stated that Gargano is not going to get to TakeOver. Don't know what he means by that or what he's going to do to stop Johnny Gargano from getting to take over, but they already got my money. They already got my money. I can't wait to see those two guys. That is a quintessential takeover confrontation. Tommaso Ciampa is going one-on-one with Adam Cole, more than likely because there was a very good promo vignette with Tommaso Ciampa about Goldie and him wanting Goldie back. And then we got Keith Lee. See, the thing with Keith Lee is, I don't know if he's going to win the North American Championship on NXT TV or they're going to give us a fuck finish because it's happening in two weeks. I don't know if they're going to do a fuck finish and then do it in Portland, which I think is the right idea. Uh, I think I would rather see that in front of the larger audience and Keith Lee that big push. Or maybe, maybe I'm I'm completely wrong and Keith Lee's not going to win a major championship because I threw this out there when we talked about the Royal Rumble on the podcast last weekend. Keith Lee could very well be in the Royal Rumble and he could be the one to eliminate Brock Lesnar. It's not out of the realm of possibility. So he could lose and then get thrusted to a demotion on Monday Night Raw. So I don't know what NXT or WWE are going to do with Keith Lee. So there's a couple of variables there. And if he wins the North American Championship and still ends up in the Royal Rumble, I would not have him eliminated in relatively quick fashion against Brock Lesnar, because I have a feeling, and we're going to talk about this in just a little bit, I have a feeling that Brock Lesnar is going to be the one guy, I honestly fear that the WWE is going to book Brock Lesnar in the Royal Rumble in a manner in which he dominates everybody. He'll be the only one in the Royal Rumble. We'll have. It's going to be like we have 28 different matches with, or 29 different matches with Brock Lesnar in the Royal Rumble. That's what I fear WWE is going to do until that number 30 position, no matter who it is, I don't know who it could be. I got my guesses, but I have a feeling whoever that number 30 guy is, because that's the way WWE does things. They want to make it seem big. And then we end up disappointed in the end anyway. That number 30 is going to be Brock Lesnar's WrestleMania opponent. He's going to be the one to eliminate Brock Lesnar. And the title is not on the line. So if he eliminates Brock Lesnar to win the Royal Rumble, that pretty much serves as... His way in for a WWE championship, right? He's got all he's got to do is come out on Raw and say, I eliminated Lesnar. Not only do I get a WWE championship match, but now I can formally come out and say, I won the Royal Rumble, so I want Brock Lesnar. I don't know what they're going to do with that, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. I don't want to jump ahead here. Uh, AEW's viewership was slightly down from last week's 967,000 viewers. But they were up against heavy sports competition last week. And this week was the first live episode of NXT in 2020. So this week's viewership is something that they should be very happy about since they managed to keep most of the audience from last week. Yeah, they should be very happy, especially after that women's segment that was a complete disaster on Dynamite. They're lucky that they didn't lose viewership due to that segment. NXT was up from last week's show, 548,000 views, but that's not a real fair assumption to make. That's not a real fair comparison to make because that was a New Year's episode. There was a highlight show. It was an award show. It wasn't a real episode. They're lucky that they even did 548000 for a show that pretty much had nothing on it. So I don't even know why you're comparing the NXT number from this week to last week. The increase was expected being that there was nothing more than highlights 
and an award show giving out the yearly NXT awards, which nobody really gives a shit about. This week's Dynamite was headlined by John Moxley making his decision to join the inner circle and Chris Jericho. NXT closed out with Keith Lee becoming the number one contender for the NXT North American Championship and Roderick Strong. The women's division in AEW needs a complete overhaul. It needs a complete reset. Whatever the Nightmare Collective is, is garbage. Whatever the women's division is doing right now is complete garbage. I went over this on AEW Dynamite. I do not want to go over the issues with Dynamite again. But I hear people saying, well, they need to add a mid-card championship now. Really? Don't. Add, there's no rush to add a TV title or an intercontinental title or a mid-card title, whatever the fuck you want to call it. There's no rush to do that right now. Why would you do that? Let's add some more top-tier talent to add to this show. Then you could start talking about a mid-card title. They got so many other issues right now that they got to take care of that you want to add more issues? Come on. Take care of one thing, make sure it's on its way to being fixed, and then worry about what you got to worry about next. Because that women's division is fucking terrible. Absolutely god-awful. The Nightmare Collective is something that I don't really want to see again. And I ranted on this, and I'm going to mention this, and that's it. The one thing, the one thing, and I don't, I don't listen to Jim Cornette. I do not listen to Jim Cornette. I heard people come to me and tell me that Jim Cornette's prophecy and Jim Cornette's statements regarding AEW appear to be coming true. And after I did some research on Dr. Luther, who appeared on AEW Dynamite, Apparently, he is very good friends with Chris Jericho. Chris Jericho Instagrammed about him on Instagram. He did a post about him on Instagram, welcoming him into the AEW family. I don't know what the mentality is in AEW. I don't. But if they get and continue to get more comfortable with this bringing in friends and bringing in family and giving them high-tier roles in the company, and giving them TV time, etc., etc. You cannot bring in friends and family for the sake of bringing in friends and family and have it trump and overtake what's best for business. Dr. Luther is not best for business. Bringing in friends and family because you owe somebody a fucking favor, because you've known them for 20 plus years, because you respect them, blah, blah, blah. It's not best for business. It's not. Tony Khan needs to fucking separate friends and pleasure and worry about the fucking business aspect of it. Because right now, from what I see from AEW, they're not the same AEW that started on October 2nd. The AEW that started on October 2nd was, we're going to take over the fucking world, motherfucker, and you're going to be our bitch. That was the AEW on October 2nd. The AEW now? I don't know what the fuck I'm watching. They got glimpses of the show where I know it's going to be great. But you got to look at the Moxleys and the Jerichos and the MJFs and the Cody's and the Lucha Brothers and the Omegas, right? Other than that, what is on Dynamite that I should really care about? What is on Dynamite that's going to get me excited about what they're doing? Storylines haven't been interesting outside of the Inner Circle and Moxley and Jericho or whoever Jericho's in the ring with. Tag team wrestling is nothing more than fucking spots, 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 spots. You know, it, it doesn't resemble what I see in NXT or what I resemble in the Undisputed Era. I don't see none of that shit happening on AEW television. What am I getting excited about? And what's with the six-man tags? Tag team matches every week. Six-man tags every single week. If that doesn't give you a sense of that they need more singles talent on this roster, I don't know what does. Can't complain about them anymore, man. They know their issues. It's up to them to fucking fix them. Because I want them to be great. I know they can be great. I know they can be the true alternative that we all need. But not if you're putting on shit like the Nightmare Collective. Monday Night Raw is no better. Dynamite's still better than Monday Night Raw in most weeks. But I don't want you to sink down to their fucking, their, their, their level on any given segment. You shouldn't have to. Speaking of NXT, WWE higher-ups decided not to promote NXT superstars Deanna Perrazzo and Chelsea Green. Good. Good. There's no reason why they should be on the main roster anyway. 
On Wednesday, Chelsea Green made her NXT TV debut by attacking Mia Yim and Kaden Carter after their match on the show. After the beatdown, Chelsea Green aligned herself with a fellow former Impact Wrestling star, Robert Stone, a.k.a. Robbie A, bro. This came after Green actually made her Raw debut last month, losing to Charlotte Flair. Following on from this, Green defeated Sarah Logan on main event. What the whoop the fucking do? The week prior, Chelsea Green's tag team partner from NXT's house show Cirque, Deanna Perrazzo, also made her Raw debut. As a result, many people were confused about the future of Perrazzo and Green on the main roster. I'm fans of both. I'm a big fan of Deanna Perrazzo. I want them to succeed. And I want them to be known and get their brand out there and just go out there and tell the world who they are. Can't do that if you're pulled from NXT and put on Monday Night Raw with no backstory and no reason to care. You can't do that. Can't do that. So, however, following her appearance on NXT TV on Wednesday, Dave Meltzer noted on Wrestling Observer Live that this likely means that WWE decided against promoting either woman to the main roster. Good. Good. He says, and I quote, the thing with Chelsea Green is that I was told, because you know when Chelsea Green and Deanna Peraza did those matches on Raw, the idea was to look at them and they may get brought up. The key was that they might get brought up because they're not on NXT TV. Once they get put on NXT TV, they're off limits for a long time. Then it's going to be one of those things where they have to work everything out. So as soon as Chelsea Green showed up on the show, it's like she got no chance to go to Raw where they could probably use her and she'd be protected, but she's staying in NXT and going to be managed by Robert Stone, end quote. Good. There's no reason why Chelsea Green or Deanna Perrazzo should be moved to Monday Night Raw and SmackDown on Fox because nobody knows a goddamn thing about them. They have not wrestled at all for NXT, so why would you expect me on the main roster to care about them? Now, I know who they are, but 99% of the audience doesn't. Let them grow in NXT before you think about moving them on so that we get maybe that 1% that doesn't know them or, or that 1% that does know them. Maybe we move the 99% that don't know them to about 75%. At least it's better than pulling them out of NXT and putting them on the main roster and expecting them to swim when you know damn well they're going to do nothing more than sink. Shayna Baszler seems to be on her way up to Monday Night Raw to feud with Becky Lynch. That's my pick for the Women's Royal Rumble. Shayna Baszler versus Becky Lynch more than likely will be one of the headlining matches going into WrestleMania 36 for the Raw Women's Championship. Couple more stories from NXT here. WWE signs Mercedes Martinez. Why? A, first of all, before I even ask why, why wasn't this woman signed after the first two appearances that she made for WWE in the Mae Young Classic? That's what I would love to know. Was she not good enough to sign then? What makes her good enough to sign now in 2020? Oh, that's right. She appeared on AEW television not too long ago. WWE scouring the free agent market and seeing who's not signed and who worked for AEW in that time. Mercedes Martinez, offer her a contract. Let's bring her on in. SoCal Uncensored is reporting that WWE has signed independent star Mercedes Martinez to a contract and she will be reporting to NXT. She's a 20-year veteran. Don't know why this woman wasn't signed beforehand, like I, like I mentioned. Martinez has wrestled all around the world for companies such as Shimmer, Ring of Honor, World Extreme Wrestling, Women Superstars Uncensored, Beyond Wrestling, and is the current AWS Heavyweight Champion. She was also a part of the AEW's Women's Battle Royal at Double or Nothing earlier this year, but no permanent deal was agreed upon. Martinez has been part of both May Young Classic tournaments and has appeared on NXT on a number of occasions. So Cal Uncensored's report reads, and I quote, I don't know if this is a dirt sheet or, or what. I don't think this is the SoCal Uncensored. It's not like Scorpio Sky is reporting this news or anything. They say, and I quote, sources have confirmed that WWE has signed independent wrestler and current AWS heavyweight champion, Mercedes Martinez to a contract she is expected to report to the WWE Performance Center in Orlando, Florida this month, end quote. Why? You don't have enough female talent down at NXT, now you need Mercedes Martinez, who should have already been signed to the company, but now in 2020, now you deem her good enough? And Tony Khan, bro, I don't know what you're doing. Or Brandy, or whoever the fuck's in charge over there. Talent relations. 
Why wasn't this woman given a contract that was worth more money than what WWE was offering her? Why? There's absolutely no reason why this woman is not given a contract. Now, if she made, or they made, I should say, they made her a contract with a very good upside, and she declined it, so be it. At least she tried. But WWE, you know, I don't know. You know, she's not a a spring chicken anymore. Maybe she wants to join the WWE. She wants to be a part of the biggest pro wrestling company in the world because she doesn't have much more to do. She's done it all. And she would rather go out on top in the WWE than go to AEW where right now the women's division, it ain't looking that attractive. And that's another reason why they got to build it up over there because if you're looking at people like Mercedes Martinez and you're looking at people like Tessa Blanchard when her contract is up, what are you going to be offering her? You're going to be offering her this and a big money contract for X amount of years and what? What type of division are you going to bring her in? Two. What are you going to do? You got to have the division look attractive if you want to bring in other women. No reason why. I, I I would love to know. If there's a report out there, someone please tell me if this woman was offered a AEW contract. And I would love to know if that was the case or if there was no contract being offered, what was the reason why she wasn't offered a contract? I just don't understand it. 20-year veteran. You don't think she could do good in the AEW women's division? WWE signs another female talent and their roster right now as far as women go, man, it is absolutely unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. So she was in the first two May Young Classics. In the inaugural May Young Classics, she made it to the semifinals where she was eventually defeated by Shayna Baszler. WWE is considering a main roster call-up for EO Shirai. Oh, really? Oh, really? You want to drive someone away from the company? Then demote them to Raw. During Wrestling Observer Live, Dave Meltzer noted that stardom is prepared to offer both Kairi Sane and EO Shirai big money To make returns to Japan, this could present an issue if WWE wants to keep them. It was said that Io Shirai was making more money in stardom. This could tempt her to take them up on their offer. WWE would call Io Shirai up to the main roster in the meantime to get her a bigger paycheck and possibly convince her to stay. Yes, because joining the main roster is everybody's fucking dream, especially the current state in which it sits right now. I mean, look at the divisions on Raw and SmackDown. You're going to bring Io Shirai to one of those divisions and you're going to expect her to be happy up there? Sasha Banks is any indication about how people are feeling up there. My goodness, man. Io Shirai, first fucking flight back to Japan. Booked. Meltzer says this and I quote, Io may be moved to the main roster real quick to keep that from happening because... Then her pay goes way up because her pay in NXT isn't anything special. I heard she's making more money with stardom. End quote. Now, if you guys were not aware, which I was not aware of before this report, she is actually engaged to evil in New Japan Pro Wrestling. Dave Meltzer noted that EO is unhappy being so far away from evil, and this could definitely play into her decision. She wants to get married. She wants to be closer to her fiancé. That could be the only motivation right now driving her to either stay or go. WWE got lucky getting her in the first place. Now, when she's getting older and there really isn't anything else for her to do, she hasn't won the Women's Championship yet, a main roster outlook is looking very grim at the moment, it's looking very bleak. Nobody wants to go to the main roster. What are they going to do with Io Shirai on the main roster? All Io Shirai has to do is look at the unhappiness from the veterans up there. And then all Io Shirai has to do is look at Asuka and Kairi Sane. She will get buried. Absolutely buried. Nobody wants to go to the main roster. Nobody. They'd rather stay in NXT. And shame on WWE for having all the NXT talent work double as hard now, being live on the USA Network, and their pays aren't being compensated for it. I don't know what's going to happen, but man, oh man, it's going to be very interesting. A lot of unhappy talent in WWE, which could be feasting season for all those thirsty independent promotions just waiting for talent to be open. Oh man, we got a couple more stories here. Stories that don't make me happy. 
We went over this on Monday Night Raw. And the real re reason why Brock Lesnar is an entrant in the Royal Rumble, I gave you on the Raw review, the positives and the negatives. You got your fucking cretins out there. You're looking way too hard into this. Why don't you just enjoy it for what it is? You know? I come on here and I give you guys reasons, whether they're positive or negative. Let me do my job. Do I come to your fucking job and tell you how to fucking, uh, you know, cook a hamburger? Ah, uh, you got to flip. You don't flip it. Just move it up and down and move it to a different side of the grill. Do I tell you how many fucking fries you put in the fryer later? Give me a break. Would you like sweet and sour sauce or barbecue? Come on. Only one sauce. You're giving four. What's wrong with you? I'm docking pay. Do I go to your job and do that? Shut the fuck up. Real reason why Brock Lesnar is an entrant in the Royal Rumble. Now, WWE revealed what Brock Lesnar is doing at the Royal Rumble on Raw. Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, from the Chesapeake Energy Arena. I, uh, I'm just joking around. That's not how Oklahoma people talk. I'm just being an asshole. Can you allow me to be an asshole, please? I'm in an asshole mood. I need a very cold beverage. This is where Paul Heyman announced that Lesnar won't be defending the WWE Championship at the show. But yet this is a historic announcement. Meanwhile, Roman Reigns defended the WWE Championship at the Royal Rumble, and Lesnar is not. So what is historic about it? Roman Reigns entered number one. Lesnar's entering number one. What's so historic about it when it was done just a couple of years ago? Paul Heyman announced that Lesnar won't be defending the title, but Lesnar will be competing in the actual Royal Rumble match and enter the contest at number one. WrestleVotes sent out a tweet. Noting how Lesnar working the Royal Rumble match is a way to set up his match at WrestleMania 36. Which in simpler terms is WWE lazy and kind of, I guess, admitting that their creative sucks because they don't have any reason or any uh, wherewithal or any uh, thought process on how to book Brock Lesnar. Yeah, we got this guy. He's the WWE champion again. It's the same story for the last fucking five years here. What are we going to do differently to get the title off of him? And if we get the title off of him, is it going to be important? Because we did it with Reigns and we did it with Rollins. It's the same shit. It really is the same shit. So WrestleVote sent out a tweet about how Lesnar working the Rumble is going to be a way to set up his WrestleMania 36 match. The tweet also referred to how Heyman mentioned that with Lesnar working the Royal Rumble, he would face talents across all three brands, Raw, SmackDown, and NXT. And the rumor going around is that it's going to be 10 from Raw, 10 from SmackDown, and 10 from NXT going into the Royal Rumble. Russell Vogt says, and I quote, Source says WWE is doing this Lesnar in the Rumble angle as a way to set up Rock's Mania match, which could signal it's against someone from SmackDown or NXT, or as Heyman mentioned a few times on Raw, opens up a world of possibilities, end quote. Now, there is still no word yet on Lesnar's WrestleMania opponent. What everybody knows right now is that Cain Velasquez and Tyson Fury are at the top of the rumor mill. But those will reportedly not be Lesnar's opponents. Thank the fucking gods. Thank God. While discussing Brock Lesnar's possible future opponents during Wrestling Was Over Radio, Dave Meltzer revealed that one that people are talking about is not going to fill that role. He says, and I quote, I do want to say this now that I remember certain things I've been told. It couldn't be Edge. I was actually told flat out that Edge is not wrestling Brock Lesnar, not at the Royal Rumble and not at WrestleMania, end quote. Now, it was noted that Paul Heyman could pick one of his guys to face Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania. It might be too soon for some of the people that Heyman has his eye on to build for Raw's future, Edge will not be WWE's choice for Lesnar, which I don't think is a good idea anyway, especially with the nature of his prior injury. Nobody wants to be in a match with Brock Lesnar coming back from that sort of injury unless you want him to be back on the injured reserve. So if the Rated R superstar does make a return, it won't be against Brock Lesnar. Like I mentioned, you know, it could be anybody that Edge is in the ring against, really. 
You know, it could be John Cena. It could be CM Punk. If Punk wants to come back, you could do him and Rollins. Now, Punk is a long shot by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just throwing it out there as a WrestleMania match because with all the talk going on, it's definitely something that I would explore if, if Punk is a viable option. Cena and Edge... Punk and Edge, Rollins and Edge, Orton and Edge, Styles and Edge, or like I said, you could have fun with it. If Randy Orton is still feuding with AJ Styles, you could do Edge and Orton and reunite Rated RKO and put them against the OC. Seems like a fun little thing. I mean, it works, right? And Randy Orton just mentioned Edge on Monday Night Raw when he faked that injury angle on Raw last week. So it's like they were giving you seeds for that anyway. And they were in the same venue that Edge retired in. So it's not out of the realm of possibility at all. Now, I'm not going to go over it because, I, I, quite frankly, I don't want to. I'm not going to go over and I deleted my notes, so I'm not going to go over them again. If you guys want to go watch, it's in the first 20 minutes of the Monday Night Raw review. Go and watch it. I want to throw this out there at you. And, you know, this is why we are called off the script here. I want to throw this out there. I heard a lot of rumors, you know, Tyson Fury, which we'll get into in a second. I heard Rollins again. I heard Roman Reigns. Number 30 is going to be Roman Reigns. Vince is going to book Roman versus Brock Lesnar again. I swear on everything that is fucking holy. Bruce Pritchett. Michael P.S. Hayes, <laughs> Kevin Dunn, take your teeth and move them away from the fucking peripheral vision, bro. Stop. Stop. You're blocking my line of sight. Reigns and Lesnar. No. I'm sorry. I don't know who. Vince is the only one. I don't know who is going to Want that match. I don't know who desires that match. I really don't get it. It's like the way I desire Tony Storm. Nobody's desiring a Lesnar and Roman Reigns match anymore. I mean, these two had a couple of matches, and the one at WrestleMania 31 was fucking fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. One of the better WrestleMania main events that I think I've ever seen. But that next one, man, holy shit, in New Orleans, that was the cream of the crop, one of the worst fucking main events that this company has ever put on. I mean, you, you talk about a crowd shitting on a match. My goodness. My goodness. And then WWE just prolonged it, probably called an audible in the middle of the match because they knew that this shit was a sinking fucking ship. So they did the match in Crown Jewel to protect Roman Reigns or whatever fucking show it was, Super Showdown or... Whatever the fuck Saudi Arabian show it was with that steel cage, please. Please, I don't even give a shit to, to remember. Been hearing Finn Balor is another one. People talking on several podcasts. Well, Finn Balor could win the Royal Rumble. Why would you move him from NXT? Why would you move him from the main roster where they didn't do anything with him? They buried him for three years. He didn't do anything. He felt like a fucking, he, he felt like uh, an eyesore on the main roster. He was so ordinary. They move him down to NXT. He feels full. He feels wanted. He feels important. And he lives in Florida. He just got engaged. His wife lives in Florida. Why would you move him away from his new wife? Why would you move him away from happiness? Why would you move him away for Raw and SmackDown where they don't know how to book him and take him away from NXT where they know how to book him and have given him a career resurgence? Why would you do that? Doesn't make any sense logically. That would be like, okay, we don't give a fuck about Finn Balor. We want him back. We want to see him unhappy. We want him on the road 300 days a year. So his wife goes bye-bye. You know, why would you do that? You don't want to do that, Tim. Finn Balor is not going to win the Royal Rumble. Edge is not going to win the Royal Rumble. Edge is going to be in the Royal Rumble. I don't think Edge is going to win the Royal Rumble. You know, there are people out there that are saying Keith Lee... Matt Riddle is my choice to win the Royal Rumble. I mean, if now is any time to do it, I mean, Matt Riddle makes sense. Matt Riddle has been on any fucking outlet that he can be on and stated that he wants Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania. He wants to retire Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania. He wants to slay the beast. Why not? Why not take the opportunity to create a new star? 
You got it right there. If it is truly NXT, SmackDown and Raw, 10-10-10 in the Royal Rumble. And Matt Riddle's in the Royal Rumble. I think we'll get a strong showing from Matt Riddle. If he doesn't win it, he doesn't win it. I mentioned before when I was talking about Keith Lee in the North American Championship, he could not beat Roderick Strong in two weeks. Go to WrestleMania, he could he could be number 30 in the Royal Rumble. He could be the one to eliminate Brock Lesnar. He could have a strong showing against Brock Lesnar on that Sunday. He's high, he's high on Vince McMahon's list, right? Vince McMahon wants Keith Lee on the main roster. He wanted Keith Lee on the main roster coming out of the Survivor Series. He's all about Keith Lee now for about two weeks. And then when he gets Keith Lee, goodbye, buried. Apollo Crews and uh, whatever happened to Apollo Crews is going to be happening to Keith Lee. Apollo Crews have a new sit-down partner at Catering. There's a lot of different options that WWE could go with. AJ Styles is another one. I mentioned AJ and Lesnar in the Rumble, uh, in uh, WrestleMania, coming out of Raw especially, you know. But if you look up and down the Raw and SmackDown rosters, th- there is nobody, there is nobody that you could look at against Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania that's going to be new, different, and interesting. You got to look to NXT. You got to look to a Keith Lee or a Matt Riddle. And the likelihood of Matt Riddle and Keith Lee winning the Royal Rumble is incredibly low. I don't see Vince McMahon going with an NXT guy. He could. I mean, they, they gave NXT the Survivor Series, but I don't see them doing that. I want to throw something else at you guys that I've been thinking about that I really haven't heard from anybody on any podcast. And I want you guys to really think about it. I want you guys to really think about it because... With all the rumors that John Cena wants something substantial at WrestleMania. And John Cena, you know, he already has some history in the Royal Rumble. If you guys remember back in 2008, came out at number 30 when he was supposed to be out for close to a year. And he came back in like three or four months and he won the Royal Rumble in 2008, Madison Square Garden. I remember where I was and what I was doing watching that very show. Shocked as all hell to see John Cena come out at number 30 and win that Royal Rumble and go on to WrestleMania. If Brock Lesnar, and I I have a strange feeling that WWE is going to take the easy way out for the Royal Rumble because they just don't want to be bothered. This is the lack of their creativity in 2020. They put Lesnar in the Royal Rumble and they're going to take the easy way out. This is going to be a one-man show. You're getting 28. John, uh, you're going to get 28 Brock Lesnar matches at the Royal Rumble until that number 30. Until that number 30. What if WWE has Lesnar run through everybody? He gets the most eliminations in the Royal Rumble's history. Shatters the record. And then out at number 30 comes John Cena. John Cena comes out at number 30, shocks everybody, plays off the 2008 Royal Rumble where he came out at number 30. Everybody's shocked to see him. Lesnar is gassed going through everybody at the Royal Rumble. John Cena eliminates Brock Lesnar to win the Royal Rumble. And he is going on to WrestleMania to fight Brock Lesnar for the WWE Championship. Everybody talks John Cena wants a substantial role at WrestleMania. You know, if John Cena is nearing the end of his in-ring career and you really want to solidify John Cena and his resume by breaking Ric Flair's record or whatever fictional record that's in the record books, whatever. 17 world titles. When is it going to happen? They've had opportunities to do it in the past. They have not done it. This may be the only single time, the only time that they have left to do it. And you know how WWE jerks off to breaking records and fucking making moments. That is a WrestleMania moment in the making. WWE could fucking bust a nut with the records being broken, you know, because that's all they're about. And Cena and Lesnar can have a match like they had at Extreme Rules when Lesnar made his first comeback to the WWE. Remember that Extreme Rules match that they had in the main event? I forgot what year it was. Was it 2012, 2013? I don't remember the year it was, but you guys know what I'm talking about. Match of the year that year. Fucking fantastic. They could play off that. 
And John Cena could beat Brock Lesnar and win the WWE Championship in the main event of WrestleMania. Show up on Monday Night Raw. Have a match because John Cena is John Cena and he wants to fight anybody. He was never a fucking guy to back down from anybody. And at that point, Brock Lesnar can't get a rematch because there's no rematch clause in WWE. Brock Lesnar is goodbye. No more WWE championships for him, I hope, forever. Because it's the same shit. John Cena comes out and Paul Heyman, being the creative mind behind Monday Night Raw, could put someone that he wants in that role. Have John Cena drop the title. John Cena's not going to be back full-time. John Cena's not going to wrestle on every pay-per-view going on into the summer. Unless he is, I don't know. We'd be so lucky. I've appreciated John Cena more now in his later years than I ever did when he first showed up. In fact, when John Cena was in the middle of his fucking reign of terror, I stopped watching. Now, I didn't have this podcast, but if I did, I wouldn't. But that's how disenfranchised I was with the WWE. John Cena wins the title at WrestleMania, shows up on Monday Night Raw and drops the title to an Aleister Black or an AJ Styles or whomever. Could be anybody. One of Paul Heyman's guys. Could be anybody. An NXT guy. Call up somebody that Heyman's got big aspirations for and have them win the world title. John Cena wins the world title at WrestleMania, drops it the next night. Off to Hollywood he goes. He's got his... Record-setting championship win. That will be forever in the WWE history books. I haven't heard anybody talk about that. It could be something that is very possible. Cena wants a substantial moment at WrestleMania. Cena, Cena lives in Tampa Bay. Cena lives in Tampa, Florida. So if WWE wants to do that and Cena really wants that to happen and Brock Lesnar is willing to work at letting that happen, we could be in for a John Cena, Brock Lesnar main event at WrestleMania. And you know what? I don't think I would be against that. I don't think I'd be against it. You put big match John in the ring against Brock Lesnar. And I honestly think Lesnar's going to show up to work because he respects John Cena. John Cena is not going to show up to just fucking half-ass it. Because you know he's going to have to work against Brock Lesnar. And the appeal that the match is going to have, just because everybody's going to go back to the first time that they fought at Extreme Rules... They're obviously going to want to both collectively come up with a match that was better than that. It could really be something for the WrestleMania main event that I honestly think we, the fans, deserve. Now, it's not the quintessential main event that people are going to look at, you know, and say, oh my goodness, I can't wait for that. But if it gets John Cena his 17th title reign and it creates a WrestleMania moment and it's not Roman Reigns and it's not a Seth Rollins, or it's not something that we've seen previously before, or something that we don't give a shit about. What else is there left to do? It's not going to be Matt Riddle. If I had the choice, it'd be Matt Riddle, and Matt Riddle would be the WWE champion. Or Keith Lee, somebody. But it's not going to happen. I don't trust these people to walk my fucking dog. Never mind fucking book a wrestling show. Could happen. My prediction is that Cena is going to be number 30 in the Royal Rumble. It's not going to be Edge. Edge is not winning the Royal Rumble. WWE wants that number 30 position to be fucking a surprise. That number 30 is going to be Lesnar's opponent at WrestleMania. I just created a whole fucking talking point for you guys right there. Let me know what you think down below. Finally, guys, to get the fuck out of here, Vince McMahon still wants to bring in... Can't even read this because it's fucking sickening. WWE and Vince still want to bring in Tyson Fury for WrestleMania. For what? Why? Why does Vince want to bring in Tyson Fury? For what? What, so he could throw some more shadow punches again at fucking security guards? So he could go into another match and embarrass himself like he did against Braun Strowman? If Vince has any fucking right in mind, he would have looked at that Strowman match and said, no, nope, I'm sorry. I can't bring this guy back in. What a joke. What a joke. What did Tyson Fury do for ratings? Huh? Someone tell me. There'll be some fucking idiotic analyst out there. Oh, it's entertainment. They're getting publicity. They're on ABC and ESPN and Fox Sports. And I want you to fucking stroke my dick nice and slow, you fucking loser. Shut the fuck up. I don't give a shit what you have to say about all this in the mainstream. Blow me. 
Blow me. Tyson Fury belongs nowhere near a WWE ring. And I mean that wholeheartedly. This guy made fucking God knows how much money to fly over to Saudi Arabia and wrestle Braun Strowman in a god-awful embarrassment of a wrestling match. And you want to bring this guy back to Monday Night Raw and SmackDown Live. Take more opportunities away from the rest of the roster for the one show of the year that everybody looks forward to, to being on. Yeah, let's fill it with Tyson fucking Fury. You have to be out of your mind. Cain Velasquez is lumped into this situation too. Fuck it. It's not worth it. How big do WWE think these guys are? Did Tyson Fury affect the ratings in any way in a positive manner? The answer is no. Did people go out there on social media and frantically search for Tyson Fury and his match against Braun Strowman? Tyson Fury's appearances on Raw and SmackDown? Nobody gave a shit. Nobody will give a shit. It died. Soon as Crown Jewel was over, the very next day, the world went on. And Tyson Fury was back to doing what he should be doing. Training for Deontay Wilder. Russell Votes. Russell Votes woke me up this morning. Fury appeared at WrestleMania, or Fury appearing at WrestleMania in April 2020. He's very much defended or uh, dependent on whether he can defeat Deontay Wilder on February 22nd. This report states that Vince McMahon is going to be unwilling to give Fury a huge offer to appear on the pay-per-view if he just lost to Wilder. However, that could change if he walks out with the win. Russell Vogt says, and I quote, Lots of speculation regarding Tyson Fury in WrestleMania. Sources said that his fight at the MGM Grand versus Deontay Wilder on February 22nd is crucial to him appearing in Tampa. If Wilder wins, Vince isn't throwing the money at a guy who just lost on pay-per-view. To a degree, the ball is very much in Fury's court. I just became the biggest Deontay Wilder fan in the fucking world. And I hope you guys are as well. I hope Deontay Wilder fucking blasts this guy in the face so much that he can't make the 10 count. I'm going with Deontay. Because if this guy wins, then that's going to move Vince McMahon to act and throw money at this guy for what? I don't know. Can't be Lesnar. How could you even fucking conceive Brock Lesnar versus Tyson Fury? And the one thing about his match taking place in February, on February 22nd, is that he won't be in the Royal Rumble. So that's a positive. I just want you guys to know that as well. The fact that this match is taking place on February 22nd with Deontay Wilder, he will not be in the Royal Rumble. He's got a train. There's no business for him to be in the Royal Rumble. So I want Deontay Wilder to win now more than ever before. And Russell Votes is reporting that Brock Lesnar's appearance, like I mentioned, in the Royal Rumble at this month will be used to set up his feud for WrestleMania. Blah, 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 blah. And we went over that already. Vince McMahon still wants to bring in Tyson Fury for what? Now, the last time we seen Tyson Fury on a WWE TV, him and Braun Strowman became buddy-buddy, and they teased about being an alliance or a tag team to go after the tag team championships. Whatever. You want to make a fucking mockery out of the tag team titles? You know, what else? How much worse can you fucking get with the tag team championships? Go ahead. Go ahead. I don't give a shit. You want to put him in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royale and have him win it? Go ahead. I don't give a fuck. Keep this guy away from a marquee match at WrestleMania. I don't understand the pomp and the circumstance with WrestleMania. This shit needs to stop. It really does. I wish for once in fucking God knows how long, WrestleMania would focus on the actual fucking talent that is there on that roster. That is their show. You employ 250 fucking professional wrestlers and you want them to book Tyson Fury on a WrestleMania card. Cain Velasquez on a WrestleMania card. A one-legged Cain Velasquez. On a WrestleMania card. The fuck is wrong with you? What is fucking wrong with you? God, I hope to God this guy does not show face at WrestleMania in any given year. If you want this guy to come back, put him in Saudi Arabia. I don't give a fuck. It's where the embarrassments usually happen anyway. Vince McMahon wants to give Tyson Fury a WrestleMania match. It all depends on Deontay Wilder. Let's hope for a fucking knockout, TKO, on February 22nd in Las Vegas. That's all I could say about that. Guys, I'm getting the fuck out of here, man. Thank you so much for joining me here on Off The Script. If you enjoyed the podcast, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button. Turn on that bell for all notifications. If I made you laugh, hit that thumbs up. If you got your news filled for the day, 
Hit that thumbs up. If you're a fan of the podcast, hit that thumbs up. Whatever, man. Hit the thumbs up. It really helps out the channel, and I greatly appreciate it. Follow me on social media, at JD from NY206. That's on Twitter and Instagram. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on the bell for all notifications. Check out my sponsor for today's video, Tavor. Download the app for free and use our code at checkout. Save $10 off a $25 order. Use code SCRIPT at checkout. Shout out to my patrons down below in the comments section. If you guys have donated in the last month or so, you guys got shouted out down below in the comments section, pinned at the very top. If you guys want to check out all the other content on the channel, make sure you check it out down below in the description. Guys, I will see you tonight for SmackDown on Fox. Always here with the review, and I'll see you right back here on Off The Script, episode 308, part number two for your Saturday. So look forward to that in the sub boxes as well. Guys, thank you so much, and I'll see you all tonight for SmackDown, and I'll be right back here tomorrow afternoon for more Off The Script. I'll see you then.